Welcome to the AI First Business Podcast with Tina Yazdi, where we show you how companies, teams, and leaders are turning AI hype into ROI. So just to kick things off, we'd love to get a quick intro on who is Joe Reeve, what is your background in relation to AI in particular, and how did you get to Amplitude? What do you do there? Things like that. I'm Joe Reeve. I joined Amplitude about two years ago, just over two years ago. I joined through an acquisition. I was working at a company called Startup called Iteratively, which was founded completely sort of remotely during COVID uh, by a friend of mine, sort of focused on data governance, which was sort of foreshadowing for some of the stuff that becomes really important in, in AI. I joined as sort of the first software engineer outside of North America at Amplitude, and then through various twists and turns, ended up hiring a team here in London, our first European software engineering team at Amplitude, and now sort of my team spans San Francisco and, and London. Over my career, I've worked at, uh, in various places that could sort of, if you squint, be called AI, but I've this is sort of the most AI role I've ever had. In the past, I worked at a weather forecasting company, and so there was a lot of doing sort of AI-adjacent things, using AI outputs, figuring out how to get data into big models that are running on supercomputers uh, by governments and that sort of thing. Um, and so these huge volumes of data where data quality really matters. A lot of the time there, we would have a, a team of maybe 20, 30 humans going and tweaking all of the numbers before they, they got fed into the models, uh, which is sort of insane thinking back to it. I'm a product engineer by trade. I've started my own companies in the past, uh, just sort of high agency software engineer, uh, always excited to try my hand to new challenges and figure out how to solve problems that nobody's ever solved before. Just as a side question, um, can you talk a little bit more about AI ad adjacent and what you mean by that? So I guess by AI adjacent, I mean, not actively working on training models, not actively working on sort of deploying models, but doing all the, I suppose, primarily the data related pieces, what I'm, what I'm thinking of. So the, the sort of data engineering and the uh, feature engineering, feature extraction, which is basically all the stuff that's, that's still hard. The, the ML ops stuff has, has developed quite a lot, and I've not been actively involved in, in that community very much. It feels like a lot of those problems are solved. And so most of the work around AI, in my experience, is how a user's thinking about it and interacting with it and how we pulling sort of business logic to sort of sit next to the AI, and ne next to the okay. model, or next to the whatever. Got it. And just as something for later for me, would you say that the data related pieces are still a precursor to doing AI work in companies today? Like, is that work automated to some degree now? Or is that kind of the prerequisites that sure. companies still need to be addressing? Data is like the most important thing with okay. the, with anything to do with AI in, in my, my sort of experience. The really exciting thing about AI is we have loads of compute right now. So you can sort of brute force a lot of the AI machine learning stuff. This is what AutoML is, right? Just sort of let the computer try a bunch of random things. And if you spend enough money on it, you can sort of brute force and find an okay or a decent training algorithm and, and get a decent model at the end if yeah. you've got lots of data. Okay, cool. This is maybe related more to the last part of the conversation, but just so I don't forget it. Yeah. Awesome. And can you introduce us? Uh, obviously, I know Amplitude very well, but for someone who maybe is not as familiar with the company, what is Amplitude Analytics? Like, what do they do? Amplitude is, uh, we, we call ourselves a product analytics company. So our customers, people like Ford, for example, they instrument all of their software with little hooks into Amplitude that sends raw sort of user, usually user interactions with their apps sends that to us. We handle all the ingesting huge volumes of data, storing it, and then making it really easy to query it and create pretty and useful charts and analyses so you can sort of dive in and understand what your users are doing and what they're trying to do. Turns out there, there are lots of hard problems there that most customers don't want to have to resolve over and over again. And even if they do solve those problems, they usually solve them for, for a different type of data, for a more common type of data. So these sort of user interactions, it's event data. Uh, as we call it, is, is for, it's very high dimensional. So you have lots of properties. It's not very structured. Uh, and each property has lots of different potential values. It's high cardinality, which makes it quite hard to query and filter. And in many ways, it's very different to traditional databases. So there, there is a lot of sort of required technical knowledge to make these systems work well. And just for someone who may be less familiar with product analytics terminology, um, can you just quickly describe what exactly is an event and what are you thinking of when you say event properties or properties related to those events? A common challenge that a, a customer of ours might have is, I want to know how many people add something to cart in my web store. And then of those users, how many of them go to the checkout page? And then of those, how many actually type in their car details? And then of those, how many complete the purchase? And then how many come back? 
So each of those sort of interactions is, is something that we would represent as an event. So that might be they add an item to cart. And associated with that is which item did they add? Where on the website did they add it from? Was it from a recommended product or was it because they searched directly for it? And then all the sort of the rest of the flow, did they have anything else in their cart? Were they buying multiple things at once? That sort of thing. Th these are the types of interactions and ty types of metadata that we're trying to record around users interacting with uh, their products or their websites. Um, and it's very common among sort of native mobile apps as well. It, websites is sort of the easiest example. Uh, but yeah, it's sort of all over the place for, for any time a human interacts with a, a computer. And oftentimes we also use these events to represent when computers are going back and interacting with a human to, to capture those sort of two-way conversations. Got it. So events are representing these user interactions that company deems worthy of tracking and the properties give context to that. And it sounds like the companies that work with Amplitude have this data, they are tracking it. Maybe with Amplitude's guidance, they can track it with a little bit more exactitude. And, and Amplitude yeah, think... helps them process and use the data in a way that I have to say it helps them make better decisions. <laughs> yeah. Exactly. yeah. I think most of these companies have the outcome data. They have a database that tells them this is how many orders we had, this is how many viewers you add, that sort of thing. That's sort of the easy data. But what's less common to, to track at least in, in less mature organizations and bigger organizations will be solving this problem somehow, is what do people do in between these outcomes? And what, what could we change? The, the question people are trying to ask is, what could we change about our flow to make it more likely that we get certain outcomes and less likely that we get a cart abandonment issue? Got it. Kind of like moving more into um, Amplitude, how the team is structured um, and kind of where you come into the picture. Can you share a little bit, as much as you can, of course, about... What iteratively, iteratively was doing, did I say that right? Iteratively? iteratively. Um, what they were doing, um, how Amplitude kind of saw them being relevant to their main vision and in relation to Amplitude's main objective, uh, like how does that all come together? Like what's the story basically of how I iteratively came to be acquired by Amplitude? Maybe actually I can go back and, and explain why I ended up at iteratively itself. Yeah, um, okay. My my startup that I was working with failed and I sort of stepped back and I was trying to ask myself, how do I improve the world? I want to do something that's hopefully going to make some money, but it's also going to improve the world somehow. And so this is a startup that you founded? No, uh, this is iteratively that I, so I joined iteratively, which is founded by a, um, by a colleague, or by an our colleague, but my previous startup failed that I was running. I joined iteratively because my previous startup failed and I was sort of looking around the world and I wanted to figure out how I could make sure that, I, yes, I wanted to make some money, but I also wanted to make sure that unlike what had just happened, even if I fail, I will have improved the world in some way. So even the sort of the side effect of all the things that I'm, I'm doing, I want that to sort of have some positive effect. So I, I stepped back and thought, how do I improve the world? Well, I think something that's really important that we need to improve is decision making in general. I think a lot of people make bad decisions, whether that's a government or businesses or individuals. So how do you improve decision making? Giving people better data to make the decisions. How do you give people better data? Well, that's sort of a data governance problem. And that's exactly what iteratively was trying to solve. And it turns out that that's quite a hard problem and a hard problem that a bunch of Amplitude customers and Amplitude were trying to solve at the time. We made it really easy for people to sit down and think, what data do we need to collect? What questions might we need to ask in the future? But then also, how do we make sure that it's clean throughout the life cycle of that data? Because often data has to change and you need to understand and manage how it changes Otherwise, you get sort of a complete mess and you can't ask the right questions. Um, and, and, and then all that like data becomes useless. Ju just for anyone who might be new to the concept of data governance as well, um, it sounds like based on your description, it's data governance is a summary of like how you collect data, what you're collecting, how you manage it. Is that Absolutely. the right so understanding? It's, so it's sort of what, what user interactions do you want to track and what metadata do you want to track about those user interactions? Because you can very easily end up tracking loads of things none of which are useful, and then it makes it hard to find the, the useful bits within that. But then also sometimes you'll have, you'll decide on some really important things to, to collect, some really important data to collect, and then you'll hand that off to some software engineers. Software engineers are great, but there are lots of different ways to interpret things, which you might have different teams, like uh, your iOS developers and your Android developers might go off and implement the same things that you've asked for slightly differently. And then hmm. that means when you're querying that data, when you're asking a question, you ha if it hasn't been instrumented exactly the same way, you have to sort of build that into your query time, which means that basically it doesn't happen and you get really wonky answers out, out the other end. 
And this is a problem that, that Alcatraz customers have been been facing. And honestly, it's just a, a, a problem that's, that's sort of as old as data. It's how do we make sure our data is always good and we can always trust it. That's, that's what iteratively we're solving. Um, we tried to solve it by tackling, as and iteratively specifically, tried to solve it by tackling the developer persona and making it really, really clear what the requests were and making it impossible for developers to instrument it wrong uh, by building a bunch of tools. That was really appealing to Amplitude because that's basically what our enterprise customers wanted. We, we, we joined Amplitude. We combined Amplitude's existing offering there with the offering that iteratively created. We've combined them. And I think there are definitely learnings from, from that where probably if we could all roll back two and a bit years, we would probably approach it slightly differently rather than try and combine two very different approaches, one which is proactive approach to data quality and the other is a reactive approach sort of you end up with this frankenstein product where you've got proactive things and reactive things all next to each other and and sort of gets a bit confusing so probably if we rolled back we would change the way we did that but it was a really nice route into the ai stuff because obviously data quality is super important for ai and if you get garbage in you get garbage out on your ai models which if you think about the ai it's doing the same thing as a human does when they're looking at data and if the human can't get any anything useful out of the data the AI probably can't like. And just, and so Joe, you might be starting to notice, like I think the the audience for this is going to be a lot less net technical than the last um, podcast that you did. I hope that's not too annoying for you. No, no, but it's I, fine. Through. Yeah. Do, do, do like, keep pulling me back to, yeah. Yeah, I, I mean, I obviously know all these terms, but I think like what I'm trying to, hoping to achieve is to demystify some of these terminologies that I feel like already cause people to go offline or feel like they're out of their depth um, because mm-hmm. they're not that difficult to understand. They're quite like a first principle thinking. But that's why I just keep like typing into. So my next yeah. question is, um, can you talk a little bit more about proactive versus reactive data management? And you touched on the consequence, but maybe give a couple of examples of the consequences or benefits of each approach and what happens when they like kind of converge into one mixed approach. Just maybe if you have an, uh, the pr- pragmatically, like what you see works best, because probably you can't be perfect in either way. Sure. So proactive data governance is basically about sitting down and thinking really hard before you build anything or ship anything and saying what questions might we want to answer in the future. Uh, and then you go off and you, you plan it. You either use a spreadsheet or you use our tool. You sort of plan. These are the interactions we're going to measure. This is all the metadata we're going to measure. And then we give that to the developers as part of the, the feature request. And so they upfront, they instrument all of that. They, they add all of those those sort of tracking hooks into their code. And then we start saying that ideally come through perfectly the first time. Retrospective or retroactive data governance is we, we ask the developers, we probably put less time into planning. Usually it's not required, but we probably put less time into planning. And then the developers send stuff. We look at it in the tool and it's not quite right. So we go and ask them to, to fix it. Or maybe we never look at it. We don't look at it for six months. Mm-hmm. Come back in six months and it's, it looks wrong. And then you go and do some, some sort of transformations. You delete certain values. You merge certain values, rename values, that sort of thing. And actually, they're both, they're both really important. Most people don't do the proactive data governance. And we're, we're even moving away from sort of recommending that now because it's just less likely to happen and you still need to do the retrospective data governance. You will get better data if you do things proactively, but it's it's a much harder sort of sell to a non-technical team, to sort of a, a team that's mostly just, I want to see the data and I want to ask the questions and see if it's giving me reasonable answers. Retrospective data governance, going back and fixing the data once we've received it within the tool, within Amplitude, uh, is, is the most common way people do that. And it's the most flexible and, and easiest sort of way to do this. And is skipping the proactive step an acceptable approach if you want to get into more advanced data applications with AI technology? One of the things about skipping the proactive step is the biggest risks, either you collect a bunch of bad quality data that's just useless, or you forget to measure something that's important. So those basically have the same outcome, which is you have to throw away all that data from the last six months and start again, and then it takes you another six months to learn anything from it. You have to at least do a bit of the proactive thinking about the questions you might want to answer. But inevitably, you miss a question that you end up wanting wanting to know the answer to in, in six months. And this is a, a problem that is quite common and that we've got a bunch of tools and, and sort of approaches and we're investing in this area so that you can always look back. But the key thing about explicitly measuring things is that you get much higher quality than a tool that sort of records everything and then you've got a lot of noise to filter through later. 
Uh, there are swings and roundabouts to, to different ways and how much you collect. Really, the sweet spot is you collect everything you want to you ever want to ask about and you collect nothing more. So that's the sort of dream that we're, we're aiming for and that we're getting to. So just kind of to summarize how we landed here, iteratively was focused on data governance and data management, very aligned with what Amplitude does and a precursor um, also for customers who need to get value out of putting their data into a product like Amplitude. We just talked a little bit about an example of data management approaches, which is like reactive versus proactive. And on that note, would it make sense now to kind of dig a little bit into now that iteratively has been acquired by Amplitude, kind of how the team was formed, how it's been structured, um, and the kind of like types of projects that you guys are focusing on? Yeah. After the acquisition, we spent a lot of time merging these products. For anyone that's that's been part of an acquisition, they know that's a lot of work. Being being acquired is is often quite hard work. So it's the yeah. hardest I've I've ever worked in my career, I think. And I've started my own company. So uh, yeah, it's, it's it's hard work. So once we sort of got the migration process done, which took just over a year, we started looking at okay, now now we've got a, a foundation. What are the ways in which we can improve or rethink? data governance, rethink the way we approach this. My team as a product engineering team, as somebody who's been sort of in the space for a long time, we had a bunch of ideas. Now we've built a bunch of web related tools. So we're all familiar with PageSpeed Insights, for example, which is a, a tool that you can put in your website domain name, and it'll give you a score on a bunch of different sort of categories, accessibility and speed and that sort of thing. We saw that and we thought, okay, that's going to be a really useful way to help customers understand how good their plan is, how good their data is. Uh, that's, that's a really common question is, am I doing am I doing an okay job of making sure the data quality is good? So we started off with building this sort of interface that measures how good your tracking plan is, your, your sort of data across a bunch of different metrics that we think are important. And we're still adding to this list. And it gives you a big score out of 100 in the top left angle. And then once we did that, we realized so now we're telling you all the ways you could improve. We could also start suggesting new ways or suggesting that the new values or the actions you could take, not just listing out all the problems. So that's where AI sort of comes in really handy. And so this was happening alongside a bunch of other sort of research we were doing into di different AI sort of features and tools we could build. A lot of this is powered by traditional machine learning and was happening sort of before the LLM boom. It was just sort of a really powerful way to look at different events. And I think I maybe drifted off a little bit from the topic. Well, I do have a question about that. Yeah. Um, in your experience or in your own words, what would you say are characteristic of the shift from traditional machine learning to one that's powered by technologies like LLM? It's interesting that the shift from traditional machine learning to LLMs, in reality, it's, I don't think it's a shift. There's this sort of new tool, this new layer at times is useful to add on top of some of the traditional machine learning. So this headline LLM feature that we shipped at Amplitude, which is you type in a question and we'll give you a, an analysis that answers your question. That is a combination of traditional machine learning and LLMs. So you type in your question and we'll go off and using non LLMs, using code that's sort of re we wrote our own models internally. We'll look at that question and find all the different events that you might have that we think are most relevant before we pass them into the LLM. And that's really important because LLMs are both expensive and slow, but another failure mode of them is if you give them too much context, if you give them too much data as you're asking asking a question in their prompt, they get, or well, the more data you give them in the, in the prompt, the sort of less well they perform and the more confused they get and the less, the more likely they are to hallucinate. And we were having real issues with this. So we started doing all this pre-filtering to minimize the data we needed to send into the into the prompt, which meant that we got much better results on the other end. So it is sort of a, a, a growing scale. And a lot of these things you can do without machine learning, you can do it with heuristics, you know, just if this, then that, um, or you can do it with some math, fairly well-established traditional machine learning techniques. And then maybe you add GPT 3.5 or, or something like that. And then if GPT 3.5 doesn't do the job, you probably go and you say GPT 4 or whatever the next quality of model up, which is going to be slower, more expensive, but probably give you better answers. And Got that, it. So, so using the newest, kind of shiniest, most advanced thing in some ways can actually cause a regression in the performance and the quality of the output. You're, in some situations, it sounds like. Exactly. These are all these are all sort of puzzle pieces that need to be fit together in, in the right way. And that's where people talk about prompt engineering. Prompt engineering is sort of an interesting topic. I think most people think of prompt engineering as typing text into a into a prompt and then getting that sent off. 
I think in reality, the main sort of technical or the, the, the biggest hurdle there is actually prompt architecture. You're not using LLMs most of the time in, in products, in features, what we found. You're not using LLMs purely as a text input output, like in a chat sort of sense. You're taking a bunch of other data that you've got around your organization, maybe even outside of your organization. You're, this is sort of the, the uh, retrieval augmented generation is what it's called. You're collecting a bunch of data, a bunch of sort of insights, filtering that data to make sure you've got the right, you're sending the most relevant data, and then you're mm-hmm. inserting that into your prompt. So it turns out that writing prompts, prompt engineering or prompt architecture is a sh- hugely collaborative endeavor because the people that are best people to write the text are usually your designers or your product managers or you know, people with a lot of domain specific knowledge. And then, but they also need to be a little bit technical because they need to understand what data has been used to train the model. So what context the model is going to have and which words it's going to understand better. And it's a, a lot of sort of experimentation. And then you also need to pair that with people that are just good at building good UIs that sort of make it really clear what the tool is going to be doing and how to interact with it and what to type into the tool or what buttons to click, that sort of thing. And with people that are really good at going and getting data from all over the organization through APIs or you know through code. And this is sort of your back end, traditionally back end. And you need some sort of traditional machine learning people that can help you with getting together all the relevant data and filtering it and sorting it and making sure that you're doing the best thing, you're giving your best prompt as possible to, to the LLM. So it's a very, very collaborative task. And I think yeah. that doesn't get talked about enough. Uh, it's, it's completely a team sport. I feel like this is worth an entire episode. <laughs> I do want to come back to um, some of the examples that you um, talked about in terms of like releases that you've had and your experiences with taking more of like an LLM driven approach or maybe more of like a traditional machine learning approach. Uh, But just for someone who maybe in their company, like they're in their very early days of building an AI team, or maybe they're looking to find a company like Amplitude and they don't really understand how an AI team is structured and interacts with the other teams in the organization. Can you talk a little bit more about I'm seeing AI team. I'm sure that's not like the actual name of the team that you worked on. Can you tell us a little bit about how would you de- define the kind of like local team that you're on? What would you call yourselves if you have kind of like a brand in the organization? Um, and what is the scope of projects that you guys typically focus on? We we call ourselves the AI R&D team. Um, the, sorry, the AI IND? AI R&D, Research and Development. AI R&D, sir. Yeah, AI R&D team. It's not the official term that's used to describe us. Um, I think our official name is data intelligence, which is another common common term. Uh, but I think AI R and D often gets the point across that we're we're doing a lot of sort of early stage trying things out. Probably don't look to us to make a bunch of money in the next one year for the company in the next two years, but we want to research, develop some prototypes, and then give it to other people. And that was sort of our initial approach to it. And it's it's morphed a little bit over time. The, initially, it was. Just go and like build some interesting demos and then show that to the rest of the company and sell that to, the, to other teams and let them take it on. And that worked in a lot of cases. But we've mm-hmm. also, while building some of these bigger, bigger features and these demos, we've realized, hey, this is a problem that everybody's going to need to solve. So we'll build some architecture. So we're also behaving a little bit like what we call a horizontal team or a cross, cross company team. Yeah. yeah. And just for the scope, how many people on your, are on your team and like, what are the different types of roles that they have? So we've got three three product engineers here in London, plus myself. So I'm a bit bit of a product engineer, still write some code. And then two machine learning scientists, researchers in San Francisco. We're hiring a, a third machine learning uh, researcher for the team. And we've got some other machine learning people around. Because of the nature of the work we do, everyone's excited about it. So we also have lots of volunteers that come and seek us out and say, hey, we want to build on AI things. And I've got some spare time in between other projects. Can I come and help? So we, we sort of get a lot of inbound interest to come and help help us build interesting things. So the team size is it's a bit fuzzy, but people that directly work focused on this, there are myself plus three product engineers plus three machine learning scientists. And one of the key ways we work is, which I think is quite unusual, is we pair up machine learning scientists or researchers and a product engineer. So for any project, there is at least one machine learning scientist and one product engineer. Often there'll be multiple of, of each working on it to make sure that we're keeping the customer's sort of problems and the way the customers are going to interact with the, the model at the heart of the research itself. But at the and- same time, we sometimes will go off and experiment. We One of the scientists comes up with an idea, spends a couple of days making a proof of concept and says, hey, I've got this interesting thing. I'm not sure how it might be useful for a customer. Um, and those are usually sort of in people's own time and their own initiative. 
When you say unusual feature, can you talk more about how teams like yours are typically structured um, and how you arrived at this formation for the collaboration in your team? So like the, a, different, a slightly different framing for the formation of the team is before we were known as the AI R&D team internally, we were a, sub, okay. a sub team of data governance, which was a bunch of product engineers. And then through various sort of reshuffles, I ended up with two machine learning scientists working with me and my team. And it mm-hmm. wasn't sort of a deliberate, you're going to go and do AI R&D. It was, we've got these two people that like their manager isn't around anymore. So like, Joe, you, you've got capacity, you can take more. And there was a little bit of strategy there, which is we think we have a, a hypothesis that machine learning is going to be helpful in data governance, but it wasn't with the explicit aim of going and creating an AI R&D team. And this is before the LLM hype. We then, by pairing up, just by virtue of us all being in the same team, we ended up collaborating a lot on projects and the, the machine learning engineers collaborated very closely with the product engineers and we sort of started coming up with ideas and started this ball rolling. And so we we built a bunch of sort of early following, letting the machine learning engineers follow their nose. We then took a bunch of the research that they'd been doing over the last few years as part of this sort of dedicated ML team that sort of dissolved because it wasn't really solving the, the problems of the business. We sort of looked at some of the stuff that was almost done and figured out how we could productize it. And the, the previous problem had been these ML research projects, they never turn into anything because they're interesting. They're solving cool problems that we can sort of see the value of, but there's no product engineering resource to go and turn that into a feature that customers use. And so we took a bunch of this research that had mostly been done already and then figured out what the features around it could be. Just just early starting to do things that were not clear features that we could ship all the way, but just to get iterations of product engineers and machine learning engineers working together. Which is, it takes yeah. a bit of time for everybody to learn how that works. Mm-hmm. And I that just... work ends up being the basis for some of the big features we announced in our recent sort of AI announcement where we sort of did our, our GitHub Copilot moment, I suppose. But I, I'd love to learn, like dig into the big announcement and the, what, the releases that you had. But what you just said is a problem that I've heard from a few different teams now, which is that a lot of companies are actually investing already in the research part of it or in getting the data together, but it's not turned into anything. Can you walk us through more about what are some of the reasons underlying why it never turned into anything that you identified? And what did the process look like to turn it into something in terms of like, was there a lot of work needed to do around executive buy-in to make a shift? Were were there a lot of investments necessary in the team? Like kind of how did you get the company to make a bet on this and take it to the stage that you are now? You're exactly right that there are, Two, as far as I'm aware, common failure modes here. One is the research happens, but then doesn't turn into any value. The business isn't able to capture that value. And the other is you've got a, people that could go and build a bunch of features and ship a bunch of stuff, but they, they don't really belong to any specific part of the org. So then they have to go and step on other people's toes and then everything gets shut down because they don't have backing from, from leadership. So those are the two common failure modes that, that I hear about talking to, to colleagues in the space. Mm-hmm. In terms of research failure mode, where you get people, sort of machine learning team that sits there and they do lots of research, there's, there's sort of a problem in that oftentimes when something ships, even if even if they did some research that was really helpful to a feature that got shipped, if there's sort of this service team that comes in and somebody says, hey, can you please help us build some build the ML, build the AI to power this feature, we think you can do it. First of all, it requires the product team to know what, AI can and can't do. And second, there's sort of a resource contention issue with the machine learning team because there might be other people asking for it. But then even if it all works flawlessly and you ship a great product, a great feature, it's the product team that gets all the attention or all the the sort of amazing congratulations, not and, and the credit for the feature, not the ML team that spent three months sort of slogging away on trying to figure out how to how to get the database table to have decent values in it, right? That's Are you speaking bit, from sort of... a personal experience? <laughs> um, more from observation here, actually. More from okay. observation. But even within our team, it's the it's not the we've completed the research and we've got a really good a good outcome uh, that we can then go and build a cool feature with. It's not that that gets celebrated by the organization. It's the end feature, and so that's something that that as a manager, I'm really really actively focused on making sure that machine learning scientists who often don't get associated with the products because they're not the ones sort of demoing it and, and recording Loom videos and announcing things in meetings because they announce something and it's like 
a, a Python notebook and no one really gets it or cares. But when you see a feature in the product, people really care. So it, it can be a bit of a morale issue. And I can see how that you scale that out to within an organization. And if you've got this ML team that never gets any other credit, basically they're, they're sort of their researchers and all the people, the product engineers are like, I feel like all the research happens really slowly. I don't get it. A lot of the time you can sort of see this resentment build up, but right? they don't really understand the timelines that things are working on. They don't really get what they're off doing. They have a sort of gut feeling that they're not working super fast. And so this resentment does tend to build up, which we've managed to solve by creating really tight feedback loops. So an ML scientist within my team will go off and do some research for a week. And then the product engineer will say, oh, great, I'm going to go and do this. And then within within two weeks, that re- or within one week, that research has then been published into the product. So yeah, you mentioned there, there's like two common failure modes, like research happens, but the value isn't captured. Um, and people could build features and ship, but don't really belong to any part of the org. Hmm. And it's like a combination of these two often leave machine learning teams as a service team. And it's kind of like this linear workflow. Can so, you just- So there's like, one, other, one other thing here, maybe. Oh yes, go for it. Out. A really important part for a machine learning team to create lots of value at the organization is having a, a good roadmap that the rest of the organization understands. And a really common failure of a team that sees itself as a service team that other people come in and say, please help us with this, is that they don't really have a a roadmap. They're just sort of waiting for someone to show up and do stuff or ask them to do stuff. That that can be a huge range of things. So there's a lot of a lot of context switching. It might be the CFO coming and saying, Hell, hey, help us with churn prediction or or get insights out of our customer base. And then it might be a product team saying, Hey, we've got this idea for how you can make like also fill a select box. And then we've got and another team that's got an idea for an entire product that uses ML. So there's so much context switching and no sort of consistent vision that makes it really hard to get any progress and to sort of give a compelling answer of what value did you create because mm-hmm. it's done lots of bitty things that's hard to package up. And one thing that's really nice about product and features is it's really easy for everybody to look at on aggregate. And so we have to balance the sort of service team things with these other bits. But it also, if we've got a roadmap, that's sort of consistent and, and has everybody, instead of coming to the team to ask for time, they come to the roadmap and ask them for time, then it's a much easier to do this sort of trade-off. We can say, well, we're making progress towards this vision of the company in three, four years' time. So if you ask us to do this now, sure, that's going to take six months and make delay that by six months. And the CEO said he really cared about this roadmap. So now that, that's a thing that makes it easier when you've got the coherent product a team that's able to ship product. So there are kind of three unique features of the way that your team is structured that I heard. One is that you partner machine learning researchers and engineers with the product engineers side by side. Two is that you have tighter feedback loops to make sure that there's not a huge delay between the kind of research mode and all the work that goes into it staying invisible and kind of like something that people can digest. And the last one is like having a roadmap for the work that you do rather than being a reactive service team. Would you say those are like the three key features of how your team is run on Amplitude? Yeah, those those are three really important important ones. I think there's maybe one more which maybe fits into a couple of them is the understanding that machine learning scientists are really smart and they need to learn how product development works. And the product development team are really smart and they need to learn how the machine learning bit works. So we create lots of opportunities for product engineers to show in progress what they're doing. You know, everybody, we have three three times a week, everybody comes and demos what they're working on. And that might be a machine learning scientist saying, here's my Python notebook. I think I'm going to get these results out. And a product engineer gets the opportunity to say, hey, that's a really nice idea. What if we build a feature that did this? Or what if we extended this other feature with that? So we can sort of get link the, the product and the customer focus to the machine learning really sort of naturally creating space for those natural interactions but also it means that the research scientists can or machine learning engineers we sort of use the terms interchangeably they can understand how the product sort of ideation flow is working and they start building a really really close connection with the product engineers so they can start riffing off each other rather than needing big high level roadmap to be defined and then then go off and do the research they can start really actively contributing to the roadmap Got it. And how long would you say it took to undergo this transformation in your team and get to the picture that you just painted today? I think it took about six months to get to the point that we're really doing it well, I think. And that was because to get there, we were really intentional about doing things that were not necessarily going to create value, but we're going to have a be able to ship really quickly. 
because when you've got a, a research scientist that's used to going off for a project and coming back in six months time, that's just not going to work on, certainly not going to work on my team where yeah. we ship something every week, at least, you know, we're shipping constantly behind flags and gradually rolling out. So right to begin with, I think that was actually quite, quite a, a big shift and a bit of, bit of a shock for the machine learning engineers. They were used to going off and writing a bunch of docs and, and things. And we were saying, well, let, let the product be the documentation, let the code be the documentation, just work together and ship something, figure out what the two week version of that is. Yeah. I don't want, I don't want the six month version. And so it took six months of saying, make it shorter, make it shorter, do it faster, do it faster. Uh, but after the first, so it, it really rapidly accelerates sort of exponentially because it turns out people like seeing their work celebrated and used by customers. So for a bunch of researchers that are used to never having a customer talk about their, their feature, it, it, mm -hmm. it's a really rapid sort of excitement they get, possibly for the first time in their career, and they just want more and more and more of it. So I didn't have a problem convincing anyone that it was an important and good thing to do because once they did it once, which maybe they were a bit grumpy about, but once they, once they did it once, they really saw the value and they were excited. So Yeah. Th this sounds like once you have the team under you, this is kind of like a manager approach that you took that has been successful and helped people do better work. What was it like interfacing with the rest of the organization as you kind of directed this team in this new way of working? There are two ways we were wanting to interact with the, the organization. There's the horizontal infrastructure layer that we wanted to build. So we built a for example, with the LLMs, we everybody was talking about LLMs. People were coming to us saying, hey, when are you going to build an LLM feature? We built this LLM service that made it really easy for any product engineers to use, to consume LLMs. And that would go through all of the, the legal checks and mm -hmm. compliance checks to make sure we weren't accidentally sending the wrong data. So there's got a bunch of guarantees there. And we've written about that separately. And and that's all monitored and, and sort of mostly using OpenAI right now. And then in future can be extended to use other types of generative models. That was pretty easy. We wrote a bunch of docs, we did that, and then we went out and evangelized, and then no one used it. No one internally? No one internally used this service, apart from us. Then we were trying to figure out, how do we how do we get people using it? Well, I think the main thing is people are just a bit scared of LLM. They're sort of excited in their own side projects. They're following a Python tutorial or something. But our code base is TypeScript. It's a different language. They don't really get it. They don't really see how it could interact with the world, uh, with, with the, the product. So we went into a bunch yeah. of different teams and created lots yeah. of small features. Just in, as an example, what would be a situation where you imagined another team using this L LLM service? We were just sort of expecting people to play around and, and tell us that they were playing around. We weren't necessarily expecting people to ship stuff to, to production yet. We and and is this people. other engineering teams in the company? Other, other product engineering teams from other, other products, product engineering other, teams. Yeah, yeah. Got it. We were sort of expecting these other product engineering teams to go off and play around with it and then come back and tell us what they thought and maybe ship some features, but probably not. And then we would help guide them. Instead, what happened was people looked at it and they said, this is great and interesting, but not really sure what happened, well, what to do about it. And then we had an internal hackathon, which changed the whole thing. It was a week-long hackathon out in San Francisco. And I think 50% of the projects were LLM-powered and all of the, the winners were LLM-powered or you know, most of the winners of the hackathon were, were LLM-powered. So that really sort of got people more experienced and more interested in using using LLMs. But then still, they didn't build anything into their day job. They didn't change their roadmaps and, and, and improve things in the roadmap. So they improved their, their features with LLMs. So we went out and went, worked with lots of different teams and we just sort of built features. Actually, we really just went to other teams, product engineering teams, and mm -hmm. without asking them, without telling them we were doing it, we would just make a make a pull request, make make the feature, and then put it in front of them and say, "Hey, we built this thing. What do you think? It's behind a flag. You can uh, you can enable it for yourself and play around with it." And that really got people's excitement going. Those weren't ready to ship, but they were enough that people understood it, and then they started picking up those features. So that went well on lots of the small features. And what would be poorly. an example? Uh, of, of a small feature. So one of the core entities in Amplitude is a chart. So you build a chart, some events, it's a line chart or a bar chart or whatever, and then you click save. When you click save, it, you get given this sort of empty box that says type in a name, uh, which is pretty standard. We built an LLM to suggest a name for you. So you just look at the config of your, your chart and then suggest a name. It's a really small feature that actually is really nice to use and, and feels really good. And people think it's now been completely GA'd by that team. We haven't had any further in, in interaction with it. So it works well for some of these small features uh, where people can really easily grok it, really easily get their head around it and see the value. This bigger feature, which is the, this, we call it Ask Amplitude AI, where you type in a question and you get analyses out. That had, a, I, th I would call it a target fixation problem. 
Uh, I'm a motorcyclist. Target fixation is is when you sort of look at a thing you don't want to hit. When you're on a motorbike and you're going around a corner, you're like, I really don't want to hit the sidewalk. I really don't want to hit that child or whatever. And then so you look at the, the thing you don't want to hit just to make sure you avoid it. But often you end up hitting it because you're looking at it. I think what happened with this big feature that got lots of excitement internally was that everybody yep. was looking at it. And so it got lots of attention. Back. Yeah, can you just quickly describe? So you started with LLM, LLM as a service for the rest of the organization that could be deployed for a bunch of small features to get traction and to help people understand how to work with your team, what your team does, and help create those small wins. What exactly was the scope of this big feature, and what so, was the, the kind of like the the consequence of it that caused so much attention? So this big feature, it's it's sort of the the go to example that anyone with an amplitude, whenever an LLMs came. Up, so, oh, we should really build that. That that would be really cool. It's just like the obvious thing, the most common behavior that people take in, inside of our product. We should figure out how to automate that. Mm-hmm. So everybody was saying, this should exist. Someone should do this. It's, it wasn't really sort of our area of ownership. So we sort of stayed away from it a little bit. And then one day, one of the machine learning scientists said, hey, I played around. I figured out how we can sort of do an okay version of it. Here's my iPython notebook. So he demoed that to the rest of our organization, or our subgroup. And then apparently, I went to bed here in London, apparently everybody in the San Francisco office was talking about it. And this is like a tech demo inside of a tech sort of like a a small subdivision of our product development department. So uh, it sort of spread like wildfire internally. I woke up to a message from my VP saying, whatever that was, do more. Like, how do we keep the momentum up? So we canceled the work that a couple of the guys on my team were doing that day and we spent I think six or seven hours, basically. So just a, a working day focused on making a pretty UI. And it wasn't even hooked up to the to the LLM. It was just a pretty UI that sort of demonstrates the value. So like very, very M- MVP. And then we rec- recorded a demo of that and shared that to the rest of the org. And then that blew up even more. And suddenly all of go to market and the sales and, and marketing were, were, were sort of asking about it, asking when it was going to be ready. Basically, we'd spent two days on this. We spent one day of machine learning research or like LLM experimentation and one day of UI hacking together. And, and it, needed, it needed multiple days just to get it to a state that we could continue developing on it because it was, mm-hmm. it was very hacked. That sort of had a mixed reception. Everybody was excited, apart from the people that felt that it was their domain, that they should be doing it. Because we were quite aggressive with just, for the demo, we didn't push any code. For the demo, we just sort of added buttons all over the interface that obviously could not be there in reality, but they were just there for the, for the demo. It did upset some people, quite understandably, I think. And that sort of started that project off, I think, a little bit on the wrong foot because it wasn't a collaborative project. And I think rolling that back, I would have signposted much more clearly, this is this is a one day, one day of work. We only decided to work on it this morning. It needs three months worth of work just to make it sort of shippable. Yeah. On that note, who do you... So I think like this brings up an interesting question about getting things done and pushing it out in an area that is kind of like pushing the technology being used inside of the company. And like that just requires messy heads down work sometimes. And then managing the stakeholders that can be impacted by this important work. Like how do you think of balancing those things? And who do you think should be responsible for the internal comms around mm. what you're doing? to free up headspace for people like in your role to just like get the work done. Do you have a philosophy or a point of view on that? Yeah. So it, it is a real part of like getting AI projects off the ground at many companies. Yeah. So at the end of the day for us, we managed to ship the feature. Despite yeah. all these problems, it worked. And that's purely because we had all the way from the CEO, every single layer of leadership wanting this to happen with it in my sort of reporting line. So between me and the CEO, everybody wanted this to happen. They were saying, this needs to happen. I don't care. I don't care what happens, what the, the consequences are, just make it happen so that we can ship something. And so the co-founders were involved and, and pushing this and encouraging us. And that was really good and it felt really good, but what it, it happened at the cost of longer term sort of shipping speed, that long tail of that feature where now we were trying to work with this other team's customers and this other team's product managers and engineers and trying to get them to own it, which is what had worked for all the other features. We then said, hey, we've built this thing can you own it? And they were like, well, we don't feel like part of this. We don't want to be anything to do with it. You've you've gone off and done something else. And now you're trying to throw it onto us. And to us, it was like, this is a really exciting feature. Everybody in the organization wants it. We're giving you a gift here. Like, can you you take it and and run with it and get all the the praise? But because we weren't collaborative in that way uh, at the beginning, even though we did manage to ship it, we sort of made the sort of long tail much harder than it needed to be. 
Okay. I think it's not possible to just say somebody else can worry about it and it not be my problem. And this is basically what my initial approach was. This not my problem. I'm being told to do this by everybody. I'm just going to go and do it and somebody else can suffer the consequences or no one will, hopefully. Yeah. But that's not working sort of long term. So now we've had to reset, get everybody in the same room and, and talk it out. And everybody's now in, in a good spot and we're all happy yeah. and we're excited about the future of the project. But it was an important thing to do. So I, I'm curious, like, it, it sounds like you have a lot of really valuable learnings from that. Um, and thank you for sharing this kind of like story. What advice would you have for someone else in your position that might have a project like this land in their lap in terms of what are some like key things, some hygiene checks you should do um, before diving right in with your team? I think it's it's still great to do the one day MVP. But it's just clearly signpost. It's a one day MVP before sharing it publicly to everybody else. Hey, this is your area. We did a one day MVP. We think this could be cool. Do you want to announce this? Do you want to share this? Do you want to get all the, the initial credit? Uh, that would be my sort of advice for getting people on side because then they can be seen as the drivers. And then when everybody's saying, this is cool, we need more of this, everybody goes to them as the drivers and says, we want you to keep doing that. So I think that's probably, if I was going to change something, it would have been that. And I think it's really easy to fall into the trap, particularly with this time zone issue. The time zone sort of allowed us to do this yeah, without being told case- to. Yeah, you have like a team based out of London and also a team based out of yeah. San Francisco. Yeah, but this this time time zone difference allowed us to people uh, to make sure that people in San Francisco went to bed, and then they woke up to the next iteration of this cool, exciting thing. So they went to bed excited, woke up even more excited, which <laughs> is really powerful for getting momentum and building momentum. But uh, it does sometimes mean people feel blindsided, and we didn't do enough to counter counteract that. That's that's sort of my key takeaway. There is. You've got to make sure people don't feel blindsided. So just be like explicit and proactive with communicating that this is a one day MVP, signposting it. Are, are yeah. there any other like kind of maybe tactical pointers that you have for someone else who might again be in the same situation on how they can so, do the communication hygiene in a way that doesn't that allows them to work at the beginning and in the long tail of the project efficiently so with the rest of the Maybe one of the, the most sort of useful things here is what we're doing with that the feature going forward with our planets. Sure. We've we've looked at that feature and it's an interesting feature. It got target fixated. It didn't become the best version of the feature it could be. It didn't get enough user feedback and, and that mm-hmm. sort of thing. It just we built something cool and then just built more of that thing rather than step back. Which I think is a common failure mode actually with LLM features, at least mm-hmm. right now. What we're doing now is taking the team that owns that area, we're flying the London team out to San Francisco, gonna sit in a room, we're gonna say, right. From first principles, what should this feature be? Mm-hmm. So step one is we're resetting. We maybe we'll continue refining this. Maybe we're going to start again from scratch. And and that's sort of an important part of just making sure everybody's in the room for the for the beginning of that that feature. So that's getting people in the same room, so they're not Chinese whispers over Slack. It's not forced meetings over Zoom where people are actually annoyed but they can't express it. That that sort of physical communication in the same place is, is really important. And another really important thing is just to understand the incentives and the communication. I think what happened was this team was asked to take on the feature from us and they were told, this is a feature, do your normal process, make it really good. What we were told was, this is the most important thing that you as a, an engineering team are working on, make sure this happens in the next month. We had this sort of mismatch of expectations where my team was pushing this as hard as possible and the other team was, to us, was sort of dragging their heels, not doing anything. We were told they were going to be taking it on and no progress happened. But in reality, it's because they were following their process and, and doing what they'd been asked to do. So it's just a mismatch of mis- mismatch of expectations, which did actually happen from sort of a, a bit higher up, and it wasn't their fault at all. But we got frustrated because we were expecting to see it sort of take off and go to the moon. That was a personal learning moment, which is understand what <laughs> people people are generally trying to do the right thing. Uh, don't let the sort of perceived reasons, which are probably wrong, uh, frustrate you and, and get in the way of sort of making sure that at the end of the day, the best version of the feature ships. Awesome. And I think that's a great kind of like synthesis of from your learnings in your career, how you've structured and gotten to the team in the shape that it's in at Amplitude, kind of like the an example of an output. But even once you have the team structured and mm. resourced the way that you like, like that's just the beginning, it sounds like, a, of a greater journey. On that note, I think um, I'd love to just circle back and touch a little bit on what we talked at the beginning of our conversation around your personal drivers, which is like helping people make better decisions. Um, and the last time we synced, we talked about, we called it 
digital product revolution. Um, but I, I know you had some thoughts around sustaining versus disruptive innovation, as well as some thoughts around like maybe advice for companies out there on their AI strategy and how it relates to data strategy and how those two things are part of each other's hierarchies. Um, do you mind if we like kind of like sure. move over to that? Okay. Amplitude as an organization and as a product helps people move forward the sophistication of their digital products. Uh, based on kind of your viewpoint, what what would do you think is the next evolution of of digital products? And do you think technologies like LLM and various other AI technologies are going to change the baseline of what users are expecting from digital product products to expect things to be more personalized, more customized, faster, more intelligent, more useful, right thing at the right time? Like, what do you think the impact there is going to be? What we're seeing is that machine traditional machine learning, non LLM stuff there's still so much, so much of a way to go. This is not a solved problem. And the problem isn't even the technical problem. It's just sort of the imagination and the understanding how this can work. And LLMs have sped up that cycle of, hey, look at all these amazing things an LLM can do. And then it forces you to think about the ML things, the traditional ML things. And then you start realizing there's lots to to do. So the vast majority Mm -hmm. of the stuff my team's working on is traditional ML related um, still because it's required for the LLM stuff. AI to me is is very much, and this is, I think, true of, you can see it if you look back over the traditional ML and and self-driving cars and all these things. AI is a sustaining innovation rather than a disruptive innovation. And and this is, these terms are from an HBR article and also HBR article, which I recommend reading. So sustaining innovation being one that's sort of, maybe a disruptive innovation is one that's, companies go out of business, they shut Mm -hmm. down, they're no longer relevant because something's completely disrupted them. turns out that if you really are sort of aggressive about thinking this way, Basically, nothing is a disruptive innovation. Even Uber didn't, I mean, it it disrupted taxis, but I'm in London. There are still a lot of old school black cabs here, and I use them regularly. So even Uber, as a disruptor, did not really disrupt the the industry. It changed the industry, but it's both versions of the industry still exist. And this is what it seems to me with AI is a sustaining innovation for digital products. It's raising the bottom bar. So the the least a, a product can be, is, is getting higher. People are getting higher expectations. But it's also raising the sort of the top bar, which is we can make these products more intelligent. So my personal vision is that over time, instead of us thinking about digital products, we start thinking about intelligent digital products. Rather than there's like an AI chatbot off to the side that you can type into and that's your AI piece. I, I see AI, ML, all these things being integrated into all the individual features. Because it turns out designers, product designers, are actually pretty good at their jobs and they build good interfaces most of the time. And that's actually the most efficient way to interact with an application. No one wants to control amplitude by typing into a chatbot to make it go and click buttons for it. It's just, that's not going to be a fun experience for anyone. What I mean by sustaining innovation here is it's going to make every single feature we ship, we're going to have sort of this expectation that it's going to be smart, this expectation that it's going to guess. And I felt this for a long time with using things like Google Maps, right? Mm-hmm. When I'm, I always do the same behavior at the same time, when I'm always going to the same, you know, uh, wanting the fastest tube route to, to wherever I'm going. At the same time, every morning it's the, the, the cafe or whatever. It knows that. I've done that before, but somehow Google, with all of its money and all of its smart people, can't predict that. And that's not actually because it can't predict it. It does actually predict a lot of things quite well. It's just that it's hard. And so but not hard technically, it's just hard to get everything together. So it seems like there's a lot of sort of a push as people are, are expected to add more of this intelligence to their product. The sort of the, the the difficult sort of bit surrounding these intelligent features has to get easier because it's not the it's not the ML piece, it's not the the prediction piece, it's the moving data around, collecting data, reading data, putting it all in the right place so that you can then train an ML model. And that's something that at Amplitude, we have a really good opportunity with because we're already the ingestion pipeline for people's user data, behavioral data. And we already have our own query system that's really, really powerful for this kind of thing. So for us, it's very easy to sort of train models on top of user behavior. And we've got one of the, I think, the biggest, the best database of, of human behavioral data. You know, we've got data from all these different types of uh, types of industries. And we've got It's all very highly sort of structured and our customers are actively using our tools to govern it and and improve the quality. So this is where the sort of data governance sort of history comes in, where we're building AI to help improve the quality of the data and help our customers improve the quality of the data, which then improves the AI itself. So then we can start understanding a lot more about users and humans. 
And on that note, um, can you maybe share some thoughts around or advice for companies who are building their AI strategy maybe for the first time and talk about how maybe some prerequisites that they should think about in building an AI, AI strategy and also how that relates to maybe a pre-existing or overall data strategy? And if you think there's like a hierarchy between those two. I think an AI strategy is sort of a subset of a data strategy, or at the very least, it requires a data strategy. Given data is the most important thing, that's just, you need to solve that problem. And there are many ways you could solve that problem. You could either collect loads of data yourself, or you can hopefully rely on some of your, your trusted vendors to do that for you. And this isn't me trying to, to, to sell anything in particular, but at Altitude, we have a massive data advantage over any one of our customers, because we've got this aggregated data from similar companies, very different companies. So we have, in terms of the data we have access to, it's mu much more than, than they're ever going to be able to collect on their own, by definition, and how, how we work as a sort of super connector of this data. I think the most important thing is to find a partner. If you're not already in a spot like Amplitude is, where lots of people are sending you data, the way you're going to win isn't by doing really, really smart stuff on, on your data. I mean, that, you may be able to do a lot of really good stuff there. But I think it's going to be much easier to win by partnering with a trusted vendor that's actually good at data and AI. So if they're a data company, hopefully they're good at data already. And then you, you sort of, it's, it's part of choosing a vendor, right? You want to make sure that that vendor is going to be useful for you in the long term, not just right now, does it solve the one problem I have? You want to know, does this solve the problem that I'm going to have with my strategy for the next 10 years? I think right. finding finding the places you already send your data and seeing if you can use any any AI offering or or get more data, aggregated data, out of them is, is really important for your own data strategy. Got it. And um, are there some maybe key pillars that you think are foundational to having a good AI strategy that people should be thinking about? Yeah, I guess the space is changing a lot. So I, I wouldn't want to say this is the, these are the specific things you should do. The most important things are, in my mind, are sort of iteration times. You just got to focus on getting iteration time down and then giving smart people the tools they need to go and explore. Uh, and that's that's at least our approach right now. And we have some high level ideas that we're we're shooting towards, and then we have lots of shorter term milestones. But what we focus on is the infrastructure, making it really easy to to throw together new experiments with large amounts of data. Because otherwise, it, if it takes six months just to to run a simple experiment, you're never going to be able to try a hundred things, and, and maybe one of them works. Focusing on the access to data and speed of access to data and the flexibility there is, I think, really important. And, and having sort of a, the ability to spend money is another important thing because a lot of machine learning is quite expensive. If it's hard to access the data you need to access to, to train models and you can't spend money on the compute you need, then you're just going to have a really hard time and you're going to have a bunch of people doing stuff on their laptops. It's going to take three days. You're going to leave their laptop open for, for three days at home and then you, they can't go into the office and talk to other people, whatever it is. Getting access to, to data really easy and fast and getting access to compute really easy and fast. And just since it's come up, in terms of the cost of machine learning, um, what, what do you mean by access to data and access to compute? I imagine access to data includes the data that you yourself collect directly as a company, but I imagine it includes other types of unstructured data as well. Sure. I mean, most of the stuff we're doing at the moment is very much around querying the data that we have in Amplitude. So all of our yeah. customers send data into Amplitude, their, their end user data, and also data about how they're using it. We send lots of data. Maybe other companies might store in Snowflake or something. We do have a Snowflake instance that we store lots of data in. But we also store a lot of things in, in Amplitude because we're sort of drinking our own champagne, trying to make sure that we're learning how what the, the limits of Amplitude are so we can improve it. So a lot of our data that we use is in Amplitude. And we've we've sort of solved this query problem already for our customers. And so we've solved it for ourselves as well, naturally, just because we have access to this powerful query engine. For others, that might just be giving people access to the databases they need and not making them complete sort of long, tedious, very reasonable for a compliance point of view, but long, tedious processes to get access to certain types of potentially sensitive data. This is a, you need to upfront decide we trust these people they're exploring the future of this company, hopefully. Uh, so we need to trust them and, and make sure they're good and they have access to the data they need. And then in terms of compute, we have we we we're very heavily on AWS, so we have a, a, a really really close relationship with with AWS there, particularly with the machine learning team, the AI team. We get access to try out some of the new tools early on. But the most important thing is just you know we we can stand up SageMaker. Uh, sort of model training runs really easily, and we can run our models there in our staging environment very very happily. Got it. Yeah. And just kind of going back to something you mentioned really early in the conversation that 
improving how decision making is and especially data informed decision making. Would love to kind of close on where are you in that journey and kind of what what are you, what are your next steps in kind of helping improve the world's decision making or sure. the decision making of the leaders that you work with. So I think the the initial sort of place I stood on improving the quality of data was let's get the it's a very much an engineering perspective. Let's make sure that the types of data are correct. When you're sending a string, you're always sending a string and it's the right string. When you're sending a number, you're sending the right number. That sort of thing. Those are important, but also a lot of those problems can sort of be abstracted away. And, and, and in fact, amplitude does. If you send a number sometimes and sometimes it's a, a string of a number or something, or like that's a solved problem. That's not, a, that's not really the main issue. The, the issue is that the, for data quality that we're yeah. seeing that's, that's hard for us to solve or hard for customers to solve that we're investing a lot in is detecting when things change. Because oftentimes people are aware when they start recording data, yeah. they, they they check it. But we want to know when it breaks because someone's changed something, there's a bug, or or maybe there really has just been a change in user behavior and that's something you need to be aware of. So mm-hmm. to me, on that journey, it's sort of getting deeper and deeper into the rabbit hole of what it means to have data that blocks you from making good decisions. And often that's, a lot of the time, it's just pure trust. Even if the data is perfect, if someone doesn't trust it, they're not going to use it. And they're going to make gut decisions instead of using the potentially perfect data. So a lot of this is constantly monitoring. And this is where traditional ML is really useful. Constantly monitoring all the data you're receiving and saying, hey, there's an anomaly here. Maybe that's because you've suddenly stopped sending some data, which is a mistake. Yeah. Or maybe it's because the user behavior has changed. And so on certain devices in certain countries, you've suddenly seen a drop off of, of all usage, which is unusual. So anomaly detection is sort of the thing that I'm really excited about there. And then we've we've solved a lot of this now. There's still more to go, but we've solved a lot of a lot of this internally that we're now releasing. So now the thing I'm looking at is what are the anomalies in the conversions of certain events to an important event? So well, I, I guess it was just the um, has there been a change in your application? Like there's suddenly a, a new error that means that people are no longer reaching that conversion event, that sort of checkout or whatever. There could be far more important events, I suppose, for different companies. I think just kind of coming back to the the barriers around data-driven decision-making, it sounds like trust in the data continues to be an ongoing barrier to people making truly data-driven decision-making, whether it's output from an LLM or some kind of AI algorithm or even just traditional d- machine learning. Is that something that you're still observing today? Trust is, is the biggest issue and... The only way you can solve trust is by being really proactive, at looking for issues and surfacing them immediately, and then helping people resolve it immediately. If you think about how a how a human builds trust with another human, for example, it's by having transparency. When someone gets it wrong, it's really clearly expressed, and there's an apology. Uh, and, and so, how do we get people to trust their data? It's by being transparent about their data, about what's happening with the data, and then when something goes wrong, making it really clear when something's gone wrong. No, that makes sense. Well, so I think we've gone through all the major points that we had overviewed in our last call um, and covered a lot of interesting new ground as well. Do you have any closing thoughts or anything that maybe we didn't have a chance to cover in the conversation so far that you wanted to quickly share? I think this field, even traditional ML, it's still a young field and particularly applying it into products. So this intelligent digital products, it's, it's a very young field. So there is no right way to do it yet. My guess is that the the most important thing to focus on is iteration speed get people able to experiment the whole way around research and productionizing it within two weeks and that should be your sort of your metric and that's a really well-established metric within software engineering product engineering Mm -hmm. and this is one of those things that we can sort of share with machine learning as a as an industry Awesome. Um, Joe, thank you so much for joining me today. This conversation, I think, will add value to a lot of people, especially those navigating how to build an AI team for the first time or launch the first major product release related on the work that they've done in in the data side of things. So really appreciate you sharing your thoughts. It's been absolutely great. Thanks. Really enjoyed the conversation. Thanks for listening. If you've gained value from this episode, please drop us a five-star rating on Spotify or a like on YouTube. See you for the next one.